Welcome to this session on um, our shared research data management um, project or initiative that we're embarking on at JISC. I'm Rachel Bruce, Deputy Chief Innovation Officer from JISC. And what I will do is, I will start off by telling you what JISC is, because we're an organisation in the UK and some of you may not be aware um, of the sort of remit that we have. Um, and then I'll also outline some of the context in terms of the research data policy within the UK and some of the drivers which are um, encouraging our universities to look at um, research data management solutions from an institutional perspective rather than a disciplinary perspective. Um, and then I shall um, outline where we are with our initiative in terms of developing a shared research data management service. And some of you might say at the end of it when you hear it, is that a shared service, Rachel? Um, and let's say this is exploratory, okay? So um, we'll, we'll see where we get to. Um, okay, so what is JISC? We um, are an organisation that serves all of the higher education institutions within the UK and also the further education and skills providers. Um, we're a not-for-profit um, and it says we provide digital services and solutions but take solutions in quite a broad sense so that might include exploratory work and change initiatives in terms of working with new um, information or ICT challenges and opportunities with the sector. Um, and the three things that we do, so we, we deliver shared digital um, infrastructure and services. So for example, um, we deliver the network, the equivalent to Internet 2 um, in the UK, and we also provide a lot of services which are what you might call digital library services, so quite similar to things like the California Digital Library um, delivers. Uh, then we also undertake um, negotiation and um, I suppose sometimes some consensus building and influencing with um, products um, such as software, uh, cloud provision and also of course access to academic content. So we undertake um, the negotiations um, for journals um, within the UK for, also, for all of the universities and also um, the research councils. Um, and then there's advice and guidance, so that advice and guidance can include all sorts of things um, such as advice around legal issues for information or um, technology, um, advice around the adoption of e-portfolios um, and it goes on. So basically anything to do with information and digital technology um, and its influence um, and adoption in um, education and research. So for some of those that have um, been aware of JISC before. We have undergone a reorganisation, um, so, uh, gosh, it's, it's taken a while. So maybe four years ago, we were not a legal entity, and now we are a legal entity, um, and all of our different services are served more holistically as one under a, a single governance. So our um, vision and mission, which I won't read out to you apart from I will read out the vision, it makes me quite scared actually, to make the UK the most digitally advanced education and research nation in the world. So um, it's yeah, quite, quite a challenge and aspiration, but I think that's about um, really keeping us focused on making sure that we are deliver delivering solutions. Hello, Peter. <laughs> Hello. Um, so um, I, I talked about... Um, mentioned there the way in which we've been redesigned and reorganized and one of the things um, that we have looked at is how we can in the current um, economic climate uh, deliver more focused research and development and innovation activity so previously we used to have a lot of grant funding that was thousand flower bloom sort of thing um, whereas now we've got this process which is called co-design where we work very closely with um, sector representatives to identify the key areas in which we should focus all of our um, R&D or innovation um, activity so these um, logos here represent the six areas that we are currently focused on um, within research and development and um, the shared research data management service falls under research at risk but just to give you a flavour of um, some of the sorts of other activities so in terms of learning analytics so universities and colleges wanted to work with us 
um, I think in two aspects around learning analytics. So one was really just a community of practice, um, sharing lessons, trying to understand how to implement learning analytics. So there's been a lot of um, work around consent issues and ethical issues. Um, but then also to trial some of the solutions. So we have um, now got a shared data management, um, sorry, shared data warehouse um, for the sector. And we've also, um, got two um, analytics engines, one that is a proprietary commercial solution and the other an open um, source tool so people have options. And then we're working with the um, community that's been built um, to identify new areas and to do some R&D and develop new analytics tools. And that's obviously all around supporting the student experience. And it's proving quite popular, a little bit too popular actually. So I think there's about 60 universities which want to work with us um, in terms of using the developing shared services um, and yeah we're having to manage that that demand um, so we'll see how that goes but those are the sorts of things that we've been doing in our um, research and development portfolio so going back to um, research data management and um, the policy landscape in the UK so um, there has been a lot of work from um, the research councils around research data management for many years. So we have seven research councils in the UK that cover different disciplinary areas. Um, and obviously for a time um, there's been a quite substantial provision around social science data and earth and environmental science data. Um, but in terms of the drive towards um, improved research integrity um, and efficiency in the reuse agenda, back in 2011, um, the research councils, um, the whole seven of them, their umbrella organisation is RCUK, um, published their principles for research data management. And of course, these are quite similar to the sorts of policies and principles that you see in the US. So the belief that um, research data are public good and should be openly available with as few as restrictions as possible, um, and all of the things that come with that in terms of management, making sure that data is um, discoverable, um, but also respecting um, some of the restraints that there might be in terms of priv privacy um, and sensitive data and commercial collaboration, um, and then um, the right of first use um, to the originator of that data. And I've highlighted sharing is not free um, because, and as I think was highlighted at the round table this morning um, that was held, that um, funding and costing for research data management is a significant issue. Um, and obviously in this, the um, funders were making an, uh, an expression in terms of the way in which their policies actually support research data management in the grant application process, but that's not the whole story, and so there is quite a big issue in terms of um, sustaining research data management. Um, and then something in terms of the UK landscape and um, some of the top-down, um, uh, I suppose, drivers, I think this is quite an important report or in the output of an inquiry, really. It was um, held by the Royal Society, and I don't think open was in the, the title of the activity at first. So there was um, anticipation in terms of what would the Royal Society come up with when um, they started to look at um, the way in which uh, science and research should be undertaken and perhaps change um, taking into account technologies and the digital environment. Um, and it came up with, it was, a, it was an extremely thorough piece of work. Um, a lot of people were consulted. Um, and it came up with um, quite a bold assertion about um, research data being made free and open access. Um, but there was quite a nuanced approach from this. So they talked about intelligent openness. Um, and intelligent openness means um, understanding that you have to do things to make data accessible and usable. Um, and then also here, as you'll see, there was this expression about making data usable and accessible for other specialists um, in the same or linked fields. So that's not to say that there isn't an aspiration to make data available and accessible to all, but it's recognising that actually, you know, first and foremost, because there are many different way, um, things that which need to be 
be undertaken to make data shareable and reusable, um, your probably primary um, audience is actually making sure that your peers and others within your discipline or linked disciplines um, have access to that data. So it was quite a nuanced approach, but it was quite bold. And um, Professor Geoffrey Bolton, who oversaw this, I mean, he, he says on occasion that um, if you do not make your data openly um, available, then um, it's tantamount to scientific malpractice. So he's quoted quite a lot of, um, in terms of saying that. Um, and then just, um, I suppose, to go a little bit uh, wider afield um, and also to outline something which I think is quite aspirational um, and um, very ambitious um, and bold, which is in the, um, the European Commission is now um, taking forward something which they have termed the European Open Science Cloud. Um, and the definition of that um, Open Science Cloud is um, up for discussion at the moment. And um, there are particular groups um, working on what that really means and giving further advice to the European Commission. Um, cloud is perhaps a bit confusing because it doesn't necessarily mean um, cloud technology. It, it really is about um, a more transparent and joined up research infrastructure um, and it is about sharing data across borders. So it's part and parcel of their digital single market initiative. Um, and overall looking at, um, as highlighted here, removing the technical and legal barriers um, to sharing of data. It's ambitious in terms of it actually aspires to look at private and public um, actors within that space. Um, and also to um, try and coordinate the member state research infrastructure um, with the European um, infrastructure because clearly there are um, shared infrastructures across Europe as well as um, member states having the infrastructures that they provide um, and also looking at um, disciplinary infrastructures so a big issue is going to be um, governance um, around this and it's early days um, we expect a communication to come out um, in March um, and that communication will only be the start of development, really. However, um, just to point to some of the, um, the, the policy landscape that we are looking to respond to. So, um, of course, something which um, we, again, at the round table was said quite a lot. So we, we don't really have many incentives in terms of researchers sharing research data. Um, and this piece of work that was undertaken by medical uh, research funders and also um, social science research funders um, concluded, again, that you know, there is little formal recognition for data outputs. And this seems to be quite a big problem in, you know, we've got all of the, the mandates saying let's make um, data open, but we don't really have the incentives in the system. Um, and in particular within the UK environment is the research excellence framework um, because we have this dual support system um, and the outputs of research are evaluated um, via this process um, and whilst data is recognised as a research output in that process it goes towards things like um, innovative research environments so it's not weighted in the same way um, as a publication. However, um, the people that oversee that have to make sure that they are um, they have a policy really that's I suppose in tune with the majority of people and so at the moment um, recognizing data and promoting data within that process is perhaps um, over and above um, what can realistically be achieved but they're consulting on that so Going back to why um, universities are seeking shared research data management um, services um, is we may not have many carrots, but we certainly have um, quite a big stick in the UK, and this has been in the form of the EPSRC, so the Engineering and Physical Sciences um, Research Council's policy, which has been a mandate which has changed, um, certainly from our research funders, the perspective um, f in terms of the responsibility for research data management. So the responsibility actually being that of the university or the research organisation. 
So the research organisation needing to make sure that its researchers are aware of the, the policies, um, actually also provide um, training um, and provide access to the tools and the infrastructure in order for them to make sure that they can manage their data and make it accessible. And then this final one at the bottom, securely preserved for a minimum of 10 years from last use. Um, that's caused quite a lot of discussion, um, I think, on two counts, because um, universities are not sure how to define the point of last use, um, and also um, they don't necessarily have the infrastructure in place to make sure that data is um, preserved. So um, that's been quite a challenge. I think at first, this policy was rolled out, um, so it was first announced in 2011, and then universities were given a period of time to develop a roadmap in terms of how they were going to meet this. Um, and then it was from the 1st of May um, this year that the mandate was in place. Um, and there's been a change in the mood, I think, during that time. So at first, um, throwing hands up in the air, then um, anxiety. And now I think actually there's a change in terms of universities are seeing this as an opportunity to steward their digital assets um, and have actually looked to respond um, to this mandate, also looking at how they can respond to um, uh, uh, the curation and um, sharing of data across different disciplines. So there's definitely, and the other thing that, that that mandate has done is it's obviously put research data management on the top table within universities, and so that's quite a change. Um, you do now actually have vice chancellors talking about it. Um, so an example of that is there's just recently been um, this open research data concordat that has been... Um, which was spurred on by that mandate. So again, because of some of the anxiety, it was an expression between research funders and universities to say, OK, we all aspire to sharing our data, but we know it's a journey. And we need to accept that this is a journey, but we'll have this shared statement. And I know in discussions of um, the Open Research Data Concordat, vice chancellors have said, OK, that's fair enough, but <laughs> we want the solution. So um, can we actually address this and how? So um, what we have um, is obviously a fairly small sector in comparison to your own, um, where we have a number of organisations, let's say 150 rounds it up, um, that actually need to make sure they have a research data management um, solution in place. Um, and they have been working on that, but there are different rates of progress. It's certainly very um, fragmented. Um, a lot of the small specialist institutions don't have the um, capability to provide um, services. Um, and again, those sorts of factors, I think when we were consulting around what to do with research data management, the, uh, the most common thing that was said was, we really don't want or to be you know, doing this um, on our own. We need to be able to share lessons. So this um, shows, this was a, a poll taken by the Digital Curation Centre um, at a workshop. It is a while ago, but I still think it's quite a good indicator of progress. So on the left-hand side, you've got the key elements um, required in order to provide a research data management service, so all the way down from your policy and strategy um, to data management plans um, and then the skills and training, access and storage management and um, cataloguing, publishing and preservation. And the red is actually implementation. So you can see that um, I think overall, I'm trying to remember, I think this came from about 40 universities were represented in this poll. Um, and it was 2014. I think things have progressed since then, but it shows you that um, things are really quite immature in terms of um, having a sustainable um, research data management infrastructure. And a lot of the blue is really just thinking about things. So um, down at preservation, you know, there's a lot of thinking. Business planning and sustainability, there's a lot of thinking, but there isn't much um, implementation at this point in time. Um, and then some surveys that have been undertaken, so really the point of this is just to show that at the moment um, 
the, well, it shows the storage capacity and it shows that in about three years' time, um, people are anticipating quite an increase in terms of the amount of data that they'll need to deal with to store. So all of this obviously um, means that people are keen to um, share experiences and share services. Um, so we have tried to devise a way in which we can try and address that at a national level. Um, and going back to research at risk, so when this uh, consultation in terms of um, where JISC's funding for development should be focused um, was undertaken, this was how the stakeholders expressed what they, they wanted us to address. So realising a robust and sustainable research data management infrastructure. Um, and then I think um, if you look at the success criteria there, a cost-effective national brokered infrastructure as a service, um, perhaps more aspirational things such as research outputs will be more discoverable and reusable, fewer impediments to doing research, um, but then research data management is business as usual. So again, quite ambitious when you're thinking about how mature um, the landscape is. So in order to try and address that, we... Um, have undertaken um, some analysis, but one of the first things, because it was quite difficult for people to identify what it is they wanted to share, um, so one of the first things we did was to try and define um, the architecture for research data management, obviously based on a lot of practice that had been undertaken. So I should credit here Stuart Lewis at the University of Edinburgh and also another Lewis, John Lewis, at the University of Sheffield, who had done quite a lot, lot of work previously. Um, and so this draws from that and other um, activities. So, Going from um, your data management planning activities to um, active research data management and then moving into the area where you are ingesting data for publication, so storage for access, if you like, and then storage for preservation. Um, and then on the far right-hand side, showing that you need to link into other services, um, national um, and international. Um, and that middle top quadrant is the research information management system, which has become um, a critical piece of institutional um, infrastructure. And of course, you do see a blurring between the repository infrastructure and the research information management infrastructure. So we used that as a basis to talk to institutions to see where it was we should try and tackle shared services at first. Um, and this shows uh, the areas that we will prioritise. So that pink um, section, which if you like, is the section which will enable institutions to meet their funder mandates. So going from um, data management outside of ac ac active data management, so where you are ingesting the data into um, a repository and then moving into preservation and storage. Um, but in all of that, um, there is other activity, which as indicated here. So, of course, the Digital Curation Centre's data management um, planning service. Um, also, um, we have some agreements and services around um, the storage end. So, we have a framework agreement with Archivum, which gives, does three copies of data, and one of those copies is in um, escrow. Um, and also um, agreements with cloud providers. So in terms of the active part of our um, research data management service, where we're going to try and develop new services, it is that um, data publishing and archiving and preservation, but we do have other elements which we'll be trying to link into and link up to. Um, so the, the process, um, I've gone through the fact that obviously we've gathered requirements um, what we're now doing now is um, identifying the pilot institutions to work with because in order for this to work, um, obviously we need to have some testing with different types of institutions. Um, and we're undertaking, um, it, it is a procurement process mainly to commission um, different providers, commercial providers, um, maybe uh, community initiatives can also um, bid to the procurement, uh, universities can bid to the procurement, or development groups. There's going to be a lot of orchestration between um, these different groups. And then over a 24-month period, we will undertake um, the development. Um, 
hopefully launch a beta service um, and then we will work on, um, well, we'll be working on this all the way along, the business plan in terms of making a fully robust and sustainable service, um, hopefully in that 24 months time. Um, some of the key features in terms of um, the things that people really want um, the GISC shared service to start to address for them. So the user experience, um, people seem to think that that's pretty poor at the moment. Um, and so by working together, can we try and address the user experience? Some of the products, obviously, that are available are really quite strong in that area, but there are some... Um, products that are used around this area which are quite popular within the UK but the user experience is not optimal. Um, and then one of the biggest things that has come up has been preservation. In absolutely every um, discussion that we have had, whether it's a workshop, a survey, um, a one-to-one -one interview, um, preservation has come up as the key gap and issue that people want us um, to try and address. And primarily that's because they haven't got onto it yet themselves down at the local institutional level. Um, and so we, I, I mentioned we've got the agreement with Archivum, but this is really talking about preservation where um, you've got the tools in place to make sure that you're developing the appropriate metadata um, and also, you know, the archival imp um, information packages um, and dealing with. Um, processes of transformation and migration um, and we also have introduced into our requirements emulation um, and that may be quite ambitious. I think our preservation requirements are quite ambitious. We're going to have quite a lot of R&D I think in that space. Um, so then the other um, key issue that people um, see as something to work on through the shared service is interoperability. Um, so I mentioned the current research information management systems being um, a key um, system within institutions. Again, there, is, there are some issues around um, some of those actually having APIs in place um, to integrate with some of the other um, systems around research data management. So that would be one of the key areas that hopefully, if we work collectively, we can do um, more efficiently together. Um, and then there's also interoperability with other um, infrastructures and initiatives. So open air over there on the right hand side, that is um, a European infrastructure for open access outputs and also supporting the um, Horizon 2020 data pilot. So making sure whatever uh, we um, develop for this research data management service actually supports the standards to talk to um, other infrastructures around research data management. Um, and then obviously key things like ORCID and data site. Um, so the moving on from that. So those were the three th um, main things. So summarized here in terms of our um, vision. So trying to address researchers' um, needs, making sure they don't need to think too much about research data management. And I think some of that is um, trying to make sure that we have a way in which um, metadata can be captured easily um, and just enough to make this happen. Um, and then also um, the, the interoperable um, issue and, of course, preservation. Um, I, I really couldn't believe actually how much preservation came up and it seemed to be such an, an issue that at one point we thought okay we need to do some more exploratory work on that but then we've decided <coughs> to just be bold and put it into our shared service requirement and, um, and go for it and see where we go. So um, just to show how uh, the research data management um, activity links to some other bits of work which are going on um, in the UK to support research data management. So there are a couple of things. Um, so we have been developing a service around research data discovery. That's based on CCAN and at the moment it's harvesting data from 14 universities and five disciplinary um, research data centres. Um, there is also now the UK ORCID Consortium, um, which the Research Council's also signed up to, um, I think, two weeks ago. Um, and there are 50 universities that have joined the UK ORCID Consu Consortium. Um, and so around that, there will also be some additional development in terms of integrating ORCID into different systems. 
Um, we're also, at the moment, we've got a prototype usage statistics service. So I mentioned um, the fact that universities are not sure what the last point of access is. So we're doing some work around um, usage and what usage means. Um, and we've got, I think, 15 universities um, that are working with us on that prototype. Um, work around policies as well. Um, and then um, the Digital Curation Centre's DMP Online. So those are other core activities that um, are not being taken forward as part and parcel of that shared service, but run alongside it. And um, we will work with those. Um, and as far as possible, they will be joined up. And then there's um, a set of other activities which are more about advice and guidance. Um, and this issue of costing um, will be an initiative we need to take forward. There's been quite a lot of work in the UK around trying to understand the cost of data um, and also how it can be supported within grants, but there's more, more to be done there. Um, and something we want to be able to do, so we've had a um, small grant funding program called Research Data Spring, which has really been very small amounts of funding um, and has brought together publishers and universities um, and other stakeholders um, just to work on small innovations together. And um, so where we can pick up some of those outputs, it would be quite nice to build them into the shared service. And one in particular is called um, Giving... Uh, giving researchers credit for their data, um, and that's a collaboration between F1000 and the University of Oxford, and they've developed a tool and a protocol which allows you to um, easily publish a data paper direct from the repository. So that's quite interesting. So it'd be quite nice if we could pick up on some of those features um, as well. And then very briefly, just to say that Clearly, there are another set of services that support open access. Um, and you can see some parallels in terms of you know, discovery, policy analysis, such as the Sherpa services. I think quite a lot of people use the Sherpa services. Um, and as far as possible, we'll be looking to join up what we do within um, the Research Data Shared Service um, with those as well. Um, so the, this represents the sort of key layers in terms of what we need. Um, from uh, the user interface down to the preservation layer. Um, and we have now developed the requirements um, in a, quite a lot of detail. But at the moment, the process that has gone out um, is, is just the pre-qualification questionnaire. But these are the eight lots that we have decided we need to focus on um, to develop the shared service that, as I say, um, addresses the core components to meet um, the funda mandate. Um, so a couple there, I'm just thinking um, repository data, research data repository speaks for itself, but um, the things like the research data exchange interface, so that's looking at um, ingest and bulk upload and migration. Um, we've added an R&D strand. This came in quite late after consultation with universities on this research information and administration systems integrations. And that's primarily because of the concerns that people seem to have around interoperability with those. So we'll see what happens there. I don't know. I'm hoping um, that some of the vendors will come into the initiative and through it we will support them to develop their APIs. So hopefully it's a win-win. But you know, we shall see. Um, if, if they don't come into it, then we'll have to find other ways to deal with the problem. Um, and then around research data, so uh, preservation, so the provision of a platform. But as I said, we will have to look, I think, at development. So that lot six around um, preservation development and tools. So um, trying again to build um, in some R&D around new file formats, updating some of the open source um, registries that are available. Um, and then something, the research data reporting, um, this is actually to build a dashboard across the research data services, which would report on performance, but also things um, such as um, volume, um, perhaps the compliance with policies. Um, so we want to take that, uh, undertake that as we go. Um, and there's already been some developments in that space, um, but this is really about trying to provide um, a national service. And I imagine we will try and have more of a local, um, local reporting as well as shared UK <coughs> reporting across.
across the service. So it is um, quite ambitious and some of the things that we need to address here and why I say, you know, is it a shared service or isn't it? Because um, clearly universities have said they want a more flexible approach. So we would expect, for example, that we don't just serve one type of research data repository, um, that there should probably be two or three options um, to be able to deal with the different requirements. And also, um, I suppose, where universities are in terms of implementing um, their infrastructure. Um, and also, um, we need to be able to um, deliver the services, I suppose, as a multi-tenanted uh, tenanted, um, hosting option um, to make sure as well that institutional branding is hosted. So I think through the two years, we'll be really deciding or finding out exactly where um, the sharing is, um, but trying to support a flexible approach um, so the institutions that only need part of the solution um, can take the bits that they might want. Um, so it is going to be um, quite a lot of coordination. Um, today was the closing date for our expressions of interest from institutions. Um, I can say before I flew out here, we had enough institutions that had expressed interest. We're okay. Um, and um, it's a real mix. So we've got... Um, some medical institutions, um, arts institutions, we've got research intensive institutions, and also some which have more of a teaching portfolio. Um, we all have to try and work out how we select the optimal um, number and group, and it's really going to be about, as I say, uh, testing the different sort of cases. Um, the sorts of things which they have said um, they're interested in, I've mentioned most of these already, but there was quite um, a lot, again, about preservation. But no, there was a lot that came up around sharing and developing practice, so people really want to be able um, to share and see this as an opportunity. There was a bit about moving to centralised services, and as I say, that will be something that will be tested. And then there were more edge cases like automation with eLab notebooks, um, and clearly what we're doing at the moment would deal more with small and medium-sized data, um, and not necessarily big data, so we're going to have to start looking at that um, for further down the line. So that is about where we are in terms of um, taking forward this um, shared service. Um, and yeah, so I don't know, questions? Um, or also it would be interesting to hear from you about your experiences. Um, and in particular, um, as you might have guessed, preservation. But also um, there is a real issue in terms of engaging researchers. So it'd be interesting to know what people are doing um, in that space. Thank you. Thank you.